this last presentation is probably one of the most challenging ones uh, for me to give because it's the last thing that separates us from the party tonight. So I guess that everyone wants to head out. So I will try to do this as quick as possible. So this presentation is about recent advances in IPv6 security. Uh, before actually getting uh, into the talk, I'd like to help. I, I'd like to thank the Rucon organizers and the locals. Uh, I have been having a great time here. Very nice city. My first time to Belgium, so thank you to all of them. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, a brief introduction about myself. I work as a security research and consultant uh, for uh, SI6 Networks. I've been involved uh, in the last eight years or so on different projects for two organizations in the UK government. I'm also very active at the IETF, which is the standards organization that standardizes um, the internet protocols. And here is the URL of my personal website where you can access uh, many of the documents that we will be going through uh, during this presentation. This is the agenda of this presentation. Essentially, we will start with a motivation disclaimer and we'll go through uh, several topics that have to do with IPv6 security. This presentation is like a snapshot of the la latest advances that we have been doing in terms of IPv6 security. So it's not necessarily that all of them are related between each other, but again, there are different topics on which uh, we have been trying to make progress. Okay. So, uh, disclaimer about this presentation, first of all, it assumes that you know the basics about V6 security and that it, you know the basics about IPv6 security too. So, uh, there's almost not going to be any kind of uh, IPv6 primer or introduction. Uh, it's also the case that much of this stuff is still work in progress. So, there are um, much of the stuff that we will be talking about is um, are documented in IETF Internet Draft. So, uh, if you have any input to that work, even during the presentation or after the presentation, uh, that, that will be welcome. Uh, last disclaimer is that there are not going to be any zero days, and the reason for which I'm saying this out loud in the, uh, at the beginning of the presentation is that sometimes in security conferences, people are like waiting during the whole presentation for the zero day, and I have been at a few conferences when people got frustrated at the end of the conferences because there was no zero day. So, it's in, this, in the disclaimer already. So, uh, first of all, let's start with the motivation for this presentation. <coughs> you probably have heard about V6 already. Essentially, it's a protocol that tries to address the problem of IPv4 address exhaustion. Um, if you think about it, most of the general purpose operating systems already support it. And the truth is that whether you like it or not, and sooner or later, uh, you, will, you will end up deploying it. Actually, you might argue that most of the networks that we have nowadays have at least partial support of, of have a partial deployment of V6, because many of the devices that you have on those networks are IPv6 enabled. Uh, IPv6 represents a number of challenges, not only from the networking point of view, but also from a security point of view. Um, essentially, it's a new technology. We don't have much experience about it. There's no much support in security devices, etc., etc. So this presentation will try to summarize the attitude that you usually find in the opera operations and, and security community when it comes to uh, IPv6 security challenges. So option one that you usually find out there is that people essentially ignore there's a, the security implications of IPv6. Um, sometimes it's because ex they explicitly want to do so. In other cases it's because, for example, uh, they, there are not that many best practices available, so they, I know of cases in which uh, the network guys were trying to do the right thing, but then they talk to the security guys and they do not provide any kind of security best practices for them. Uh, option two of the attitude of the things that you see out there is this one, in which essentially people are more conscious about IP6 security issues and they say, well, there are all these things that we should address, we don't really know how to do it, and uh, they take the second attitude. Sometimes option two is a consequence of option one. So the idea is the idea of this presentation is that we want to avoid the first and the second option and go through this one, which is essentially about discussing uh, some of the IPv6 security drawbacks, but for the most part not just discuss the problems, but also try to find ways to address these problems. I know that many times in the security community pays more to actually discover problems 
in this case, uh, we will be discussing some of the problems, but for the most part, the idea is that we want to address those problems. So, um, much, of the, much of the materials that uh, I will be presenting um, today are the result of a project that we carried out during five, four or five years or so. Uh, essentially, what we did was analyze the, all of the IPv6 specifications. Also, do uh, we also analyzed some open source implementations of uh, IPv6? And uh, in those cases in which we identify problems, either in the specs or in uh, actual implementations, we came up with proposals on how to mitigate those issues. Uh, in many cases, we tried to cooperate with vendors. Uh, in some cases, we succeeded. In many others, you could add that we failed or that they didn't care. In any case, we will be talking about all this stuff. And as I said before, much of the work that we did was taken to the IDF, and um, we hope that where, um, where necessary, uh, our work will result in, in, in uh, specification updates. So let's talk a little bit about IPv6 addressing. Uh, essentially, the main driver for IPv6 deployment is the increased address space. Even when you hear things such as improve quality of service, security, or whatever that is, uh, truth is that people that deploy v6 do it because it has an increased address space. And uh, essentially, the v6 addresses are the same as we before. For example, if you take a look at the host, the addresses are aggregated into prefixes for purpose of, of routing. We also have different address types in the sense that we have unicast, multicast addresses, and so on different address scopes too, um, uh, local, global, and so on. Same thing as with before. And probably one of the few differences between V6 and V4 is that in the typical case, um, every, every IPv6 interface has more than one uh, IPv6 address configured, as opposed to the V4 case in which, except in those cases in which you have aliases, uh, you have a single address. So um, this is even when, of course, there are many combinations of global, uh, when it comes to the scope and the type of addresses, we will just discuss the global unicast addresses, which are the ones that you'll be using for uh, connecting to uh, remote, uh, remote hosts, remote services. This is the syntax of global unicast addresses, in which, as I said before, it's essentially the same thing as before. You have a global routing prefix, which is the prefix that you get from your app stream. Then a few bits for subnetting, same thing you do with uh, B4. And then you have an interface ID, which is essentially the same thing that you have in B4. But the only difference is that in B4 you call that an, uh, a host ID, and in B6 it's an interface ID. Probably the only difference when it comes to the, to the, uh, to the addresses is that since the typical interface ID in IPv6 is 64-bit long, you have many options as to how to set that interface ID. The most typical way to do it is to include the MAC address in the interface ID, modulo some, uh, some bits that you need to flip and a couple of bytes that you need to insert in the MAC address. Uh, there are other options, for example, such as privacy addresses that we will discuss in more detail later. Essentially, privacy addresses randomize the interface ID. You can also manually configure the, inter the, the address, and of course, that means also the interface ID. You could, for example, uh, set the interface ID to all zeros and just vary the last byte. And there are some transition and coexistence technologies that mandate uh, how you create those addresses. So this is the only intro, intro that we will have for V6 addressing. And the idea is to now try to analyze what are the implications of V6 addresses uh, when compared to V4 addresses. So first of all, let's analyze how, what are the implications of V6 addresses on uh, address scanning attacks. Of course, address scanning essentially means the same type of host scanning that you usually do by uh, sweeping an entire address space and, and the like. So the usual myth that you hear about um, IPv6 host scanning is that uh, an IPv6 host scanning attack takes ages. And actually, I didn't came up with this quote. Actually, when preparing the slide where I went to Google and tried to find someone saying this kind of thing. Uh, the numbers vary from something along the lines of, what's that, uh, 500 million years to maybe uh, 5,000 million years or whatever. The thing is that <coughs> uh, most people um, deem IPv6 address scanning attacks un un as unfeasible. And what we are going to do now is try to think a little bit more about this topic 
and try to come out with some conclusion as to whether those attacks are really unfeasible or not. I think that the, um, the most elemental question to answer here, to, to have an answer on this topic, is what is actually the search space when you are trying to uh, scan a remote network. So the question is whether uh, when you are scanning a remote network, the uh, search space is really 64 bits or not. Um, most of the people that come, that come up with numbers such as 500 million years or the like, they assume that um, the IPv6 uh, subnets are 64 uh, bit long, uh, that you have 64 bits for selecting the address of, of, or for selecting the host ID, and they kind of also assume that the addresses of, of the host are randomly spread over that, uh, that number of, of, of bits. So uh, when I was studying this stuff, I tried to find out whether anyone has had bothered to actually measure how IPv6 services are generated or selected. Um, there was this paper from David Malone published earlier in um, 2008. Essentially what this guy did, he tried to measure how are the addresses of cost, how are the addresses of routers uh, selected. For uh, measuring the addresses of cost, he essentially set up, I don't recall if it was a, uh, a web server or an FTP server, but he just logged those addresses and then tried to categorize the addresses into the different categories that we can see in this table. Then on the right hand side we see a um, similar, uh, similar type of measurement, but for router addresses, I think that in this case what he did, he ran Trailwood against uh, different destinations and that's how he got the addresses of routers. Um, one of the things that we can see from the two tables is that um, IPv6 services do follow patterns. For example, in the case of host, we can see that at least 50% of the addresses are based on Slack, which is uh, another way of saying that they include the MAC address in the interface ID. Then we have 20% of addresses that essentially encode an IPv4 address in the interface ID. And when it comes to routers, 70% uh, of the addresses are low byte, which means that they are manually configured and the interface ID is set to all zeros and you just vary the last byte. That's typically the thing that you do when you're manually configuring an address, because of course you're not going to set like 64 bits randomly, but you just set it to all zeros and just vary the last one so that it's easier to, to remember. Uh, other than the numbers themselves, other than the actual numbers, which uh, I would say that they have probably varied quite a lot, since uh, 2007 or 2006, when all this work was carried out, I think that uh, probably the most important result from, from this paper was that it shows very clearly that uh, IPv6 services do follow uh, specific patterns. Uh, this is the, uh, the syntax of the interface IDs when they embed uh, MAC addresses. Essentially, MAC addresses are uh, six byte long addresses. So when you want to generate an interface ID out of the MAC address, what you do is you split the MAC address into two halves and you insert the two bytes FF and FE in the middle. That's essentially what you do, modulo for tweaking, for flipping a byte in the IEEE OUI. So what can, you, what can we say about uh, these interface IDs? Well, first of all, of course, since the middle two bytes are fixed, uh, you would include include uh, those 16 bits in the search space because they are constant. Uh, now when it comes to the upper uh, 24 bits, uh, the IEEE OUI is a number that identifies the manufacturer of the, of the network interface card. So you could add that if for example you wanted to scan a specific network and you know for example what's the manufacturer of the network interface cards that are in use in that network, then you will probably have no, no many more than maybe five options, five different numbers for the upper uh, 24 bits. You simply go to IEEE's uh, website and they provide, it's, it's a publicly available the database of which vendors have been assigned which IEEE OUIs. Now when it comes to the uh, lower 24 bits, uh, in principle you might argue that those uh, 24 bits are kind of like random, so even if we consider uh, those bits to be random, the search space would be around uh, 24 bits, which already make the, the, the search space, the search, uh, space uh, feasible. Now, if you think a little bit more about the uh, low-order 24 bits, 
actually they are not really random because manufacturers uh, typically assign them sequentially. So that means that, for example, you have this uh, distributor of some vendor and they buy a bunch of systems uh, manufactured by the same vendor, then you will find that the MAC addresses are uh, consecutive. Okay, so that means that if some network has a bunch of systems from the same vendor that have been installed at the same time, chances are that if you find one system that is alive, the other ones will have consecutive MAC addresses. And that's something that you can benefit from. Also, um, we have done some role measurements, and um, the lower 24 bits of MAC addresses tend to be geographically clustered because uh, there is some distributor that buys this bunch of, of uh, systems. And they, of course, they sell those systems within the same region. So that means that if, for example, you find that this company has this range of MAC addresses, well, if uh, there is another company that bought this, uh, the same brand of systems probably at the same time, you will find that, they, 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 that their MAC address space is clustered too. So typically, worst case scenario, we will have a search space of 24 bits. And bottom line here is that when we have gone down from a search space of 64 bits, that's what's typically assumed, to 24 bits, which is a number that is feasible. Uh, something that is maybe even more interesting and that might shed some light uh, with all the virtualization uh, hip nowadays, if you look for example at, at virtualization technologies such as VirtualBox, they select the MAC addresses for the virtual interfaces from a fixed OUI, which means that if you are targeting virtual machines, you don't need to even guess or look up in IEEE's website what's the corresponding IEEE OUI, but it's fixed. So in that case, the search space is, in the worst case, 24 bits long. A similar thing happens with VMware, it's just that the IEEE OUI changes. Uh, for VirtualBox, it was 080727, whereas in the case of, VM, uh, of VMware, it's 0005 and 59. Um, Actually, when it comes to VMware, the search space is actually reduced because they set the low order um, 24 bits, not randomly, but some of those bits are fixed. For example, they are set uh, as a result of the uh, IPv4 address of the host system. So the thing is that if you are targeting virtual machines, then the search space is, in the worst case scenario, 24 bits. Again, something completely different from the original 64 bits that are typically assumed. Uh, if we look at, uh, at other address types, I mentioned that there are addresses that embed uh, IPv4 addresses. The IPv6 address rotation allows you to uh, write addresses uh, in this way, okay? So essentially for the interface ID, you can just write an IPv4 address. And that is of course useful, for example, if you are uh, uh, operating infrastructure requirements such as routers, uh, you might set the interface ID in this way so that it's trivial to remember the V6 address as opposed to having to remember, for example, the MAC address of the corresponding network interface card. If we assume that addresses are selected in this way, the search, uh, the search space is of course the same one as the IPv4 search space, and if we assume that the, that the network there is, for example, it's a slash 24, well, the search space could be something along the lines of 8 bits or worst case scenario, 16 bits. Other addresses, I mentioned IPv6 low byte addresses, and I'm using the term low byte because that's the term that David Malone used in his paper, the paper that I was referring to before. Essentially, for low byte addresses, what you do is you set the interface ID to all zero, not because you want to do that, but that's the easy way to go. So, uh, uh, in those cases, the search space will be either 8 bits or 16 bits. There are other variants of these low byte addresses. For example, there are some people that rather than changing or setting the, um, the lowest order 8 bits, they set the low order 16 bits or, or the second 16 bit word starting from the right. But essentially, the, the search space is very, very reduced when compared to the original 64 bits. Um, of course, the, the bottom line here is that we started from the assumption that the search space for finding a live host is uh, 64 bits, and then we end up finding that actually the V6 services do have patterns, and when we take like a, leap, a, a closer look at uh, each of those patterns, we find that those uh, we find that the search space can be greatly reduced. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, some industry mitigations for host scanning uh, or for address scanning Annex. Essentially, the only vendor that um, that produced some kind of mitigation for this kind of address scanning Annex was Microsoft. And if you look at their V6 uh, implementation, that's probably just the only thing that they got right. So that's why it's very important to discuss it here. And essentially, what they do is they select or they replace those services that are based on the MAC addresses. Uh, with a random number, uh, the actual specific algorithm is uh, specified in RFC 4941. Essentially, it's a random number that they generate when you install the system, and once you do that, that number is fixed. So the idea is that since they set the interface ID to a random number, now the addresses that are configuring Windows systems, they don't follow any patterns anymore. So you couldn't take advantage of any of the patterns that we were discussing before, except, of course, if one of those systems was configured, manually configured and you were to use low byte addresses or, or whatever. Uh, certainly, this approach that Microsoft follow is much better than the, those addresses that are based on IEEE identifiers, but they are still not as good as they could be. Uh, for example, they allow, uh, they still allow cost tracking, and we will talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so uh, some sorts of on uh, remote address scanning attacks, and I, may, I, I don't just say scanning attacks because there is a huge difference between scanning a network, uh, scanning a remote network versus scanning a local network. Scanning a local network is a, a mode of, for, for some tricks trivial, whereas scanning a remote network is a completely different problem. Uh, from my perspective, the VCs for scanning attacks are feasible. Of course, they are typically harder than the V4 counterpart. Um, actually, if you follow operations mainly lists, such as Nano and so on, quite a few times they have been reported and seen in the wild. Uh, of course, you might argue that uh, they require um, more intelligence uh, when compared to their B4 content part. In IPv4, the, uh, the problem scale is so small that you can get away with doing like a poor job, which means sweeping the, the entire other space. Whereas in the case of B6, you really need to do something clever or else your uh, scanning attacks are not going to be feasible. In any case, it's possible to make these um, address scanning attacks unfeasible. And in the next few slides, we will discuss some proposals that we took to the IDF to actually mitigate this problem. Uh, aside from that, I personally think that there are going to be many other um, host scanning vectors that uh, will probably be explored by attackers. There are many things that could be done, for example, trying to leverage application layer protocols. That could be from fetching torrent files, torrent, uh, files from the internet and uh, getting the addresses from there, uh, taking a look at email archives and learning the addresses from there, and many, many other different vectors. Uh, so far, of course, they have not been explored for before because uh, sweeping the other space was the uh, low hanging fruit. But with B6, even if we get to mitigate the typical other sweeping attacks, uh, my take is that those uh, alternative cost scanning uh, strategies will be explored. A couple of thoughts about uh, the implications of B6 servicing on privacy. Um, Essentially, I was mentioning before that the default uh, way or default mechanism for selecting the interface ID is to embed the MAC address. Uh, that means that no matter which network you move to, your uh, interface ID is going to remain constant because, of course, your MAC address is not going to change. Even in the case of Windows system that I said that when you bootstrap or when you install the system, they kind of like select a random interface ID they use the same interface ID as you move from one network to another. So if you think about this a little bit, for example, if you assume that you have this, uh, this interface ID over here, in which you have 111, 222, and so on, uh, maybe you connect to the first network and you get this address, 2001, colon, DBH, DB8, colon, one, and so on, and you can see that you have your interface ID uh, here in red, and now let's assume that your host moves to a second or to a, to a different uh, network, uh, which of course has a different prefix. Well, of course the prefix will change because you have, uh, you have moved from one network to another, but the interface ID will be the same. So let's now think for a second and let's say that you operate a website and now you get a connection from the first address, okay, this one, 
And now, sometime later, you get a different connection from these other routers, okay? Now, since the interface ID is the same and that value is supposed to be globally unique, then you can tell that the two addresses, even when being in different networks, are exactly the same host, okay? So that means that the interface ID is leaking out your privacy, it's leaking out your identity. So, uh, one thing has been, have been implemented out there for mitigating this privacy issue. Well, when the IPF realized about this problem, a few years ago, there was RFC 4941 that was published. Essentially, what this RFC says is that in addition to the traditional Slack addresses, you should generate a temporary address, or the privacy or temporary address, in which essentially what you do is you produce a random interface ID. And these addresses are generated in addition to the traditional Slack addresses that you have. And the basic idea is that the traditional addresses will be stable, of course you don't change those addresses uh, over time. Whereas the privacy addresses of course do change over time. So you use the stable addresses for certain like uh, functions, like getting incoming connections, whereas you would use the privacy or temporary addresses for ongoing connections, which means for performing client-like functions. So, uh, some problems related with privacy addresses, first of all, is that they are difficult to manage. So, for example, if you are operating a network, and uh, for example, in the IPv4 world, it's typical that if, you, for example, you find that there was this system that was infected and was trying to infect or attack other systems in your network, so you find the log and say, okay, this system has been infected, we should go and fix disconnected or whatever. Well, now if you have the addresses changing over time, uh, then you don't know which system was using which address at which point in time. So that's why I'm saying that these addresses are difficult to manage. And by default, there is no uh, single place in the network that keeps track, or single system in the network that keeps track of which system was using which address. As a side comment, and I will provide a link later, we actually produce a daemon to actually keep track of the addresses. And that was in response to requests from the operational community that they said that they were interested in using these services, but they had no way to actually track them. Um, when it comes to security problems, um, of course, these services do not mitigate uh, host scanning or address scanning attacks because you are still these addresses are generated in addition to the uh, permanent ones, and also they do not mitigate host tracking uh, completely. Because since you still have uh, the stable addresses there, an attacker could, for example, send group packets to different networks to try to find out whether your system is in any of those target networks. So um, this is the proposal that we took to the ITF to mitigate the, both the host scanning and the, the other scanning and the privacy issues. Uh, when trying to come up with a solution, we started analyzing what are the types of addresses that we currently have. And we categorize these services into stable and temporary. Of course, stable, you don't change them over time. Temporary, you do change them over time. And also in the categories of, of predictable and unpredictable. So if you think about the addresses that include MAC addresses in the interface ID, they are both stable and predictable. You don't change them over time. And since, of course, the MAC addresses do have partners, um, they are predictable. Uh, then if you think about the privacy addresses, they are both temporary and unpredictable. So what we try to do is to try to, uh, we try to um, come up with a proposal that could, uh, that could offer stable addresses that, would, but that were unpredictable. So they were easy to manage, but they didn't follow any kind of, of patterns so that they were difficult to, to scan. This is the scheme that we came up with. Essentially, uh, well, the name of the, the, the document name that you find there is the ITF document that uh, documents our proposal. <coughs> Essentially, the idea is that you would generate the interface ID as a result of a, a single random uh, function, could be a hash, and you compute that hash over the prefix, uh, the interface index. Typically, the interface in the index is a small number that identifies each of the network interface cards that you have. So it could be 0, 1, 2, and so on. The network ID, which could be, for example, for wireless networks and SSID, and a secret key, which is, of, which is of course, secret, okay? And, of course, we assume that F is a cryptographically secure function. Now, of course, if you look at this function, as long as um, each of the parameters is const remains constant, of course, the result of the function is going to remain constant, okay? And as soon as you vary or you change one of the parameters of this function, the result is going to change. 
Now, if you think about this, when you move from one network to another, the prefix will change, okay? The interface index will usually remain the same. The network ID will typically change, for example, if you are connected to a wireless network and the SSID changes, and the secret key will remain, will remain constant, okay? So the thing is, you are connected to one network, all of the parameters are constant, you move to a different network, now at least the prefix will change, okay? So the result of F will be different, and now if you move back to the original network, of course you get the original address that you had on, on, on that network. So the result of this proposal essentially is that you get addresses that are constant within each network. So every time you come back to the same network, you get exactly the same address. But when you move to one network to another, that interface ID changes and you get a different, uh, a different address. That means that we kind of like get the, the benefits from both worlds. So within a single network, you get a constant address, which is of course easy to manage. But now when you move from one network to another, your interface ID changes, and uh, now you can no longer uh, be traced. <clears throat> this document was already accepted by the relevant working group of the ITF, six months, and hopefully uh, it will get published as an RFC, hopefully this year, or maybe if not next year. Okay, a um, couple of comments about fragmentation and reassembly. Essentially, in IPv6, uh, all of the support for fragmentation has been removed from the base IPv6 header, and every support that you need for fragmentation is included in an extension header. So this is the format of the, the, of the corresponding extension header, the fragmentation header, which of course contains essentially the same kind of stuff that you have for fragmentation in the IPv4 world. So you need a fragment offset that tells you the offset in the original packet of this particular fragment. You get you have an end bit that tells you whether there are more fragments following or not. And you have an identification bit, with an identification field, which is used to identify a fragment that correspond to the same packet. So, um, for example, if you think about the fragment identification, its security implications, for example, when you use a predictable fragment ID, are completely known, have been, has been known for ages. We know that from the IPv4 world, idle scanning, DOS attacks, etc., etc. And in the case of V6, actually the problem is a little bit exacerbated because uh, we will probably have increased use of fragmentation as a result of protocols that, for example, use UDP, such as DNS, and uh, as a result of the additional information that needs to be transferred as a result of DNS, the larger addresses, there's probably going to be increased use of fragmentation. Now, you would argue that since we hit this problem like more than 10 years ago, in IPv4, uh, this problem was already solved for IPv6. So uh, we actually produced tools and assessed different implementations, for example, when it comes to how they generate the fragment IDs, and these are the results that we got. For example, Solaris, Windows, and um, Linux use, or some used to use uh, predictable um, fragment IDs. In the case of Linux and Solaris, uh, they produce, produce patches when we reported this to them. In the case of Windows, I never got to, I never got them to understand what was the problem. So I essentially gave up with them. Uh, so if you try this kind of thing with Windows, you will find out that they are still using uh, predictable fragment IDs uh, sele selected from a, a global counter. Uh, of course, the solution to this problem is at least in principle, it's kind of like trivial. You should avoid uh, predictable uh, fragment IDs. We have a document at the ITF, the one that is mentioned in, in, in this slide. In the current version, we discuss different possible algor algorithms to select the fragment ID. I mean, in theory, it's simpler than it is in actual pra practice. So if you want to get into the details, I recommend going to that document. But bottom line is, don't use predictable fragment IDs. Uh, another topic is that of fragment reassembly. Of course, we know from the IPv4 world that uh, when you have, uh, when you allow overlapping fragments, that can be uh, liberated to uh, evade uh, intrusion detection systems. That has been known for years, and uh, unfortunately, we have the same problem with IPv6. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an RFC, um, 5722, that was published, which essentially forbids the use of overlapping fragments. And uh, from the assessment that we did of different implementations, uh, you could argue that most current implementations already forbid these overlapping fragments. 
Uh, however, there are some, for example, the latest release of Debian, because of the version of the kernel that they, they use, they are still allowing these overlapping fragments. And in our blog, we have a table of an assessment that we did of, of different implementations when it comes to the, this issue. Uh, kind of like a uh, similar uh, problem has to do with what we call IPv6 atomic fragments, and to put it in a, to, to kind of like summarize this, the specifications require that if you get an ICMP version 6 packet to bigger error message, analogous to the uh, fragmentation needed by the FB set from the IPv4 world, uh, you are not required to, um, if the advertised MTU is uh, smaller than 1280, you are not required to actually reduce the size of your packets. But you, are, uh, but you must include a fragment header in the uh, subsequent packets that you send. Now the thing is that you have the original packet here, and uh, below that you get essentially what we call an atomic fragment, which means that you have the whole contents of the original packet, except for the fact that it includes a fragment header. Um, so you don't really need to reassemble these atomic packets with any other fragment, because everything or all of the contents of the original packet are within that fragment. It's a first fragment and last fragment at the, at the same time. So, um, what is the problem that you find with this atomic fragment? Is that uh, many implementations were essentially mixing the atomic fragments with all, all other fragments, other real fragments that they had in the fragment reassembly queue. Um, of course, that meant that you could um, easily exploit or perform fragmentation based attacks against traffic that was otherwise not using fragmentation. The way to do that was very simple, just fire an ICMP version 6 packet to be that will trigger the use of atomic fragments and once that connection is using atomic fragments then you can fire fragments to perform any IPv6 fragmentation based attack. So um, we uh, sent the proposal to the IDF, it's very straightforward. Uh, since atomic fragments are atomic, you have everything you need in the same fragment. Essentially, you shouldn't mix the atomic fragments with uh, regular fragments that you might have in your fragment reassembly queue. Uh, this is an assessment that we did for different implementations. The ones that you have marked in red, we know, are implementations that mix the atomic fragments with regular traffic. The ones that say yes are the ones that uh, implement this improved processing, which means that even if they have a fragment queue in the fragment reassembly queue, they will not mix the atomic fragments with, uh, with the regular fragments. Uh, a few of these, for example, Lin not Linux, OpenBSD, and uh, I'm not correctly if Solaris, but OpenBSD patched this in response to uh, our uh, publication and hopefully there will be others that, that will follow. A couple of comments are about IPv6 first hop security. Essentially, a first hop security is the mechanism and policy that you can uh, employ and deploy on, on your local network to address security issues. Uh, one of the main problems that we have is that we don't have future parity with IPv4. For example, in IPv4 we have tools such as ArcWatch that allow you to, tra to track uh, ARP based attacks. Uh, we don't have the same thing in IPv6, or actually we do have tools, but it's easy to circumvent those tools. And also in IPv4 we have uh, mechanisms such as DHCP uh, snooping, but we don't have parity with that in IPv6. So, what's the fundamental problem with uh, first hop security? If you think about V6 traffic, um, the, the protocols that are used, for example, for other resolutions, such as neighbor discovery, which is the equivalent of ARP in the IPv6 world, uh, operates on top of IPv6, which means that it can use, this in, uh, it can use extension headers, it can use uh, fragmentation and so on. So you could have, for example, this original packet here, okay? And an attacker, of course, in order to try to avoid or circumvent uh, security devices, he could include destination options headers or other extension headers and then fragment the packet. And what you actually get on the network are these two fragments over here, which of course are uh, essentially impossible to police in a stateless way. And since you should enforce uh, these policies at, the, at layer two, of course, it doesn't make any sense to actually try to, for example, reassemble and, and forward. You cannot actually do that. Uh, so what we did, we took a proposal to the IDF to ban the use of fragmentation for neighbor discovery. In practice, it's not needed and uh, it's not used or needed for any legitimate scenarios, but it's, it causes trouble when you want to actually enforce security policies. 
This has been already accepted by the six-month working group, and hopefully it will be published. It will be published as an RFC uh, shortly. This means that when it comes to neighbor discovery traffic, there you, you won't have such packets use fragmentation, so it will become trivial to actually filter those packets or monitor them, and, and so on. Um, a security device that was uh, standardized and actually implemented uh, years ago was uh, known or is known as Portal Advertisement Card. Essentially, this is analogous to uh, the HCP snooping. If you have a managed switch with different boards, you can tell the device, oh, oh, okay, I want you to only allow router advertisement messages on this specific board, and if you get router advertisement messages on any of the other boards, you should block them. This is what we know from the B4 wall as, for example, the HCP snooping. The ITF produced two RSCs that standardizes this. Cisco implemented this and sold this to customers, but in practice it's trivial to uh, circumvent. You just need to include the, uh, some extension here in the middle, and that's all that is needed to actually evade this device. Um, we took uh, our proposal to the ITF. It is this document that is mentioned, mentioned in this uh, slide, which essentially describes the problem of how you can evade with the, the current implementations of router advertisement guard, and it also um, and it also provides mitigation for that. Again, we're not just you know, pointing fingers at where the problems are, but for each of these issues, we actually produce mitigations. Uh, with this uh, change in mind, with this change in place, uh, uh, root advertisement guard could only be evaded with overlapping fragments, but as I mentioned before, most uh, current implementations already bundle those, those packets. This is already a document that is in the RFC editor queue, which means that it should be published as an RFC soon. Few comments about V6 firewalling. Uh, as I said before, uh, essentially from the specifications point of view, you can have packets that, ca that have any uh, number of uh, extension headers, which is this stuff that you see here, okay? And even, and not only can they have multiple extension, oops, not only can they have multiple extension headers, but they can also be fragmented. So in the network, at least in theory, you can get these packets that you're seeing in this slide. That essentially means that you cannot perform any kind of stateless filtering. The only way in which you could do IPv6 packet filtering with this thing is fine, in mind is to actually reassemble and then uh, filter and then forward, okay? So uh, again, for this case, what we took to the IDF was a proposal that essentially requires that uh, you can include as many extension headers as you want, but the whole IPv6 header chain should be, con should be contained in the, in the first fragment. Which means that the, f uh, the fragment with an offset of zero should have all the extension headers up to the upper layer header in the first fragment. Okay? And that means that when you receive a fragment, if it's the first one, you know for sure you will have for sure all the information that you need to apply um, a, a filtering policy. This is just a single aspect when it comes to um, uh, IPv6 firewalls. There are even most, more basic questions to answer. For example, nobody knows what's an IPv6 firewall. So if you are an operator and, for example, are asking vendors, uh, okay, do you have an IPv6 firewall? Well, there are many vendors that are that they do have IPv6 firewalls, but then when it comes to the features, usually they are far from what they support for IPv4. There are other cases in which, for example, um, they might have similar functionality in both protocols, by, but they implement they implement the the, the B4 part in hardware, uh, but and they implement the uh, IPv6 functionality in software, etc., etc. I personally think that there is a lot of work to do in this area, uh, so that you can have some idea of what we are talking about when we talk about IPv6 firewalling. From my personal perspective, probably one of the reasons for which. Um, we don't have any of these documents at the ITF is because essentially for the ITF firewalls have been considered evil for more than 20 years or forever if you want and that's why there essentially has been no work uh, in the area of, of firewalls, not only B6 but also B4. A uh, couple of comments about B6 implications on uh, IPv4 networks, and typically the reaction here is, well, if my network is B4 only, why should I care about B6? Well, the answer here is that most networks are not really B4 only, because many, if not most of the devices that you have on that network, they have B6 support of some form. 
That could be uh, dual stack support, that could be uh, support for transition technologies, and, and so on. Uh, there is lots of work that we did in this area, such as, for example, how you should filter different transition technologies. But uh, I tried to include in this slide where something that we came up with, uh, maybe a month ago or not more than that, which is about BPA uh, leakages. And um, this is something that is so stupid, but it's actually also so practical and so true. So let's say that you go and connect to an insecure network, let's say a conference network or whatever. What you typically do is you establish an EPA with your office, with your home or whatever, so that you, you securely tunnel all of your traffic to a place which is supposed to be a little bit more secure. Typically, the VPN uh, device or software that you use is IPv4 only, okay? So, uh, that software doesn't support IPv6. Now, what happens? So, scenario one, let's say that you are connected to a network that supports both v6 and v4 connectivity. Now, when you uh, connect to that network, you get both v4 and v6 addressing. And if the destination that you are, that you are connecting to is v6 enabled, that might mean that your traffic is not going to go through your VPN, but it's going to go in the clear over the v6 connection. And that's just a legitimate case. That could happen if I go, let's say, to the IDF network, which supports dual stack. Of course, this can be uh, actually forced or triggered by an attacker. So I'm connected to this network, essentially I throw router advertisement packets, and I tell all the local systems that I'm an uh, IPv6 enabled DNS server. So uh, when you try to visit a site or whatever, I will give you IPv6 services for those sites. And since your VPN software only supports IPv4, then you will use the native network, which is the only v uh, 6 connectivity that you have. Again, you thought that your traffic was going through the VPN, which was secure, encrypted, and so on, and now your traffic is going in the clear on a completely different network. Uh, you see, it is not unusual that when you discuss this stuff uh, with some people in the security community, there's always someone that says, oh, we knew that already, but the and of course, this was no exception. So there was a guy that at least said that he knew this stuff already, but the thing is that if you look at both open source implementation for VPN and also at, co at commercial ones, they uh, are still vulnerable to this kind of stuff. So bottom line, get this in mind if you're using a VPN or else disable, v disable basic support when you're using your VPN software because your traffic might be going out of your VPN. Tools, people like tools. So um, when it comes to V6, the only attack suite that has been there for ages was THC's IPv6 attack toolkit for many years. I have not counted them. So this is the link to, to uh, where you can find this tool. And we produce a different, brand new, uh, you call that security assessment tool, uh, toolkit, troubleshooting toolkit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the toolkit that we produce runs on Linux, BSDs, and Mac OS. We tried hard to uh, make the toolkit portable. Uh, I would argue that it's not really an attack toolkit in the sense that if you try to run the tools without any V6 knowledge, you won't get anything except like a help message telling you how to set the different options. So from my perspective, it's something, it's a toolkit that is useful if you have all your attacks or potential issues in your head and you just need software to actually convey those, those packets in the network, okay? Again, if you know the V6 stuff, you probably will find this toolkit uh, useful. If you just want to run a script to do something, like DOS something, I don't think you will find the toolkit useful. Uh, this is the URL for the toolkit. Uh, we have the, the tarbo and so on. And uh, this is also the, uh, the GitHub page where you can get the, the latest uh, version of the toolkit. These are the toolkit. These are the tools that are covered or that are included in our uh, toolkit. Scan6, a tool for performing at the time only uh, local network uh, scan attacks. A tool for performing fragmentation related attacks, a tool for playing with TCP, like doing, for example, TCP SIM flutes, but over IPv6, uh, different tools for uh, playing with IPv6 uh, neighbor discovery, etc., etc., and also tools, for example, for playing with IPv6 jumbograms, uh, sending ICMP error messages, etc., etc. Um, I don't know if I have it here, but. Uh, This is just one of the tools 
tools that we have. It's the local scanner. And this should be, I mean, this is pretty simple stuff, but uh, this is just to show that even if you think that you are not running V6, because the network is before only, these are the IPv6 addresses of systems that are connected to the Brucon network, okay? Um, there are lots of things to be added to the toolkit, okay? And, well, there's somebody that either is providing V6 connectivity or that has performed an IPv6 related attack, because like 10 minutes ago you didn't have any 2001 prefix here, okay? Again, there are lots of stuff to see in the toolkit. I was just trying to show one of the tools in action and there is much more to implement in those tools. Some conclusions, essentially I learned that uh, many of the, of the vulnerabilities that we know from the IPv4 wall have been re-implemented in IPv6. There are probably different takes on why that happened. For example, we didn't learn the lesson from IPv4. Maybe it was different people working on the V6 code as opposed to the V4 code, and that's true. If you look at the commits on the IPv4 code when compared to the V6 code, it's different people. Uh, you could also add that the, um, the ITF specification could have been more straightforward in terms of how to implement the IPv6 protocol more securely. And probably the reason for which we have um, these kind of issues in V6 implementations is a combination of all of the above uh, factors. There is still lots of work to do on V6 security, building tools, testing, implementations, etc., etc. And uh, from my perspective, the bottom line is that we need IPv6. Sooner or later, we will have to deploy it because we need additional IP addresses. So we should not only work to actually point out the problems, but also try to uh, do some work to improve the, the current uh, state of affairs. As a side comment, and if you want a politically incorrect uh, comment, if you think about the maturity of IPv6 uh, implementations, from my perspective, we are kind of like in the same place we were with IPv4 in the 90s. So you still find very stupid bugs in V6 implementations that shouldn't be there. Any questions? Yeah. Got time for a couple of questions, so if I don't fall down the stairs. Okay. okay, so um, the question is, uh, do you know anything about that if Microsoft had changed their, their mind and they plan to start to support the uh, secure uh, neighborhood discovery protocol? Um, no. As far as I know, they don't have any plans to support SEND. <coughs> I would also add that uh, one of the problems with SEND, that's my personal perspective, is that um, it's a lot of burden to solve too little in the sense that you still have so many pieces of the, I, of, of the network insecure, such as the DNS, that at this point in time, it doesn't provide much of a return of investment to actually deploy SEN. SEN requires a PKI, and for most people, that of setting up, setting up a PKI is too much of a problem. So uh, even when it comes to, for example, open source projects, uh, I think that the, the, there was the, many of them didn't have a set implementation at all. That has changed a little bit. But for example, I think that three years ago, the only thing that you had for BSDs was a Java implementation of set, which is cool for actually testing the protocol, but it's not really in production. Yeah, about uh, uh, the super cookie addresses. Uh -huh. um, isn't it enough to have um, the priority of your addresses set to? Uh, the random addresses that you uh, that you change over time, and then use your MAC-based or whatever DHCP-based address as uh, a managed address. Sorry. You have a random address. You yeah. can create it, and you can set the priority for the random address higher yeah. than your uh, managed DHCP-based or MAC address-based address. Isn't that enough for privacy? Well, no, really, I could give you a scenario. Let's say that I learned what your interface ID is, okay? I mean, of course, that mitigates uh, the problem to a large extent, okay? But host tracking is still possible. Let's just say, for example, that I know your uh, interface ID for the stable address, okay? And for some reason, I know that you will be connected at least in one of these 100 networks, okay? So one, one thing that I could do is I could send a proof to that network to your stable address and see if you're there. But I can put my managed addresses in a different subnet, or I can put my managed addresses in a firewall. 
Well, but that's well, but that is a different. Well, but actually, you couldn't or you shouldn't do that. But the, because the very reason for which you have a stable address is so that you can get incoming connections. So if you are going to firewall your stable address, just don't use the stable address. Just use no, the temporary no. one. Managed addresses you usually use for your internal management, and your uh, addresses, your random addresses, you should use for you for your internet connectivity. You should you, you don't need connections back. Well, the reason for which the reason for which when the ITF standardized RSC 4941 and they mandated that the privacy addresses were generated in addition to the stable ones, so was so that you could get incoming connections. That's their proposal, at least. Okay. okay that, that is another feature. Though. Good. Okay. Thanks. I think if there's no more questions, you'll call it a, a day or an evening or whatever you want to call it. Thanks so much, Jamarat. Okay. Great talk. Thank you. Everyone can make their way that way to beer and parties and dancing girls and dancing boys and um, whatever you prefer to that. Beulah, please Craig Walding, you're a sally number man. Could you take a top off for me? For now?